procedure that I had was um, not novel or unusual in any way. I had a fantastic general surgeon, Dr. Thomas Weiser. Thank you, Dr. Weiser, for saving my life and for preserving my quality of life. Um, but uh, he used some pretty advanced techniques that enabled me, thankfully, not have to live with a colostomy bag outside of my body for the rest of my life and incur all of the pain and cost that comes with, with that. Unfortunately, my health insurance carrier at the time didn't view my treatment that way um, because I had a slightly longer than normal ICU and hospital stay as a result of an infection that I incurred as part of the procedure, which is not uncommon, um, and denied uh, most of my health uh, care claims, saying that the procedure that I had was experimental and the result of physician malpractice. And so as I tried to sort of figure out why on earth uh, a health insurance company, a very well-known health insurance company, and a fantastic health plan by one of the country's leading technology employers would treat me this way, um, I stumbled into a lot of interesting artifacts that exist in the US healthcare system and discovered a lot of things that I will discuss in this presentation. Uh, it's not meant to be exhaustive or super detailed, but just to give you guys a high-level sense of why we think what we're doing is a better way of aligning incentives in healthcare, which I think is actually one of the most fundamental issues with our healthcare system, and that is that payers and providers don't necessarily see eye to eye on things, and the people who are receiving care um, don't often happen to be the people who are paying for care, are often left uh, like a ping pong ball in the middle, and that's how I felt. So with that, I'm gonna jump into what we do. So we founded the company in 2013. Um, our mission is to really fundamentally re-engineer, reimagine, whatever you wanna use, um, to how we navigate and pay for healthcare in this country. And jumping kind of to the chase, the reason why we chose to focus on employers is because after the federal government, employers are the biggest payers of healthcare in this country. The federal government pays for about 41% of healthcare costs in this country. Employers pay for about 38% of healthcare costs in this country, and the rest is borne by us as individuals if we're underemployed or between jobs or on an individual plan. And as a result, employers cover about 155 million Americans, which is about half of our country's population. So we felt like if we were going to do anything that had any kind of broad impact on the US healthcare system in any meaningful period of time, meaning not decades, that we had to find a private sector approach that had scale. And that private sector approach, in our opinion, was focusing on employers. And as I'll get into, specifically self-insured employers. And this is just a rehash of what I just told you in terms of the distribution of healthcare spending between you know, Medicare, Medicaid, employer-sponsored private care, and then other public and private programs. Um, jumping a, a little bit around, I think one of the things that we can all agree is that we're all confused by what we should do at any given time when we interact with the healthcare system. If you're a provider, you're sometimes confused in terms of what the payer that's requesting paperwork from you is requiring and why they require it. And if you're an individual that's covered, you're often confused by just the paperwork that you receive from your payer in terms of what's covered and what your responsibility is. And then if you're someone like an employer who's paying for your population's healthcare costs, you are often confused because you don't understand why your trend is trending in the direction that it is, why things cost what they do, why the distribution of cost is so uneven across different provider systems and medical centers. And in general, there's just a lot of confusion in terms of understanding why things cost what they do in the, in the system. And this is borne out in research that we have been conducting over the last 18 months where the vast majority of not just millennials, this is just one example of results from our recent polls, um, find their health benefit options confusing. People don't know how to actually pick a health care plan. Um, this is borne out in a lot of research, um, namely by Roger Lowenstein at Car Carnegie Mellon, where only 14% of Americans know what the difference is between a copay, coinsurance, out-of-pocket maximum, or deductible. And so how on earth can we accept people to be consumers of health care when they don't even know what like, the basic terms actually mean? Yet, health benefit choices do drive most people's career choice in some part. People do go to one employer or another because of the benefits that that employer provides. Which again, all reinforces why we felt like we needed to focus on employers and then from there potentially expand to other parts of the system. And what's unfortunate, you know, and we work with employers day in and day out, is that while they do spend so much money on health care, most employers don't have a very good understanding of what that spend is going toward. The tools that they have to really optimize that spend are highly lacking. 
and they actually don't even understand how best to incentivize their populations to stay healthy. And what we do at Collective Health is help support them in all of those activities. And I think you can understand why we're in a situation that we're in when you actually look at the underlying technology that underpins most health insurance organizations. I don't want to be disparaging to Stanford Hospital because I don't know what the IT infrastructure here looks like, but most health insurance companies that I've talked to and interact with have systems that are, you know, on sort of the newest end, 25 years old, on the oldest end, 40, sometimes 50 years old, processing claims, logging data, you know, transacting eligibility, doing all the basic things that you should do to procure and prosecute a health care plan. And so not only can these systems not talk to each other in any kind of meaningful way, oftentimes the data that comes out of them is actually unusable. And so when we were thinking about starting a company to improve the health insurance experience, we thought, hey, why can't we build this fantastic data analysis layer on top of the existing industry and build a great user experience layer on top of the existing industry, and then voila, we'd have this fantastic new age health insurance company without all of the burden of cost of rebuilding everything from scratch. And after about 12 months of research, talking to about 30 different insurance organizations and other kinds of organizations, we discovered that there was no way on God's green earth that we'd be able to have access to the kind of data that we needed to serve people effectively without actually just rebuilding the entire system from scratch. And it's probably not too different than the conclusion that you know, organizations like Apple and others, and Amazon is a good example, have come up with or come to when they've thought about entering a market and figuring out how can I build as little as possible only to discover that, oh my God, I probably need to build everything all over again in order to enact this vision that we have, at least for us, of a health insurance experience that people actually genuinely love and find value in. Moreover, systems like Amazon or like the iPhone, because of their technology orientation and architecture, have enabled ecosystems to flourish on top of them, which is something that also is pretty anathema to this industry. Most carrier systems, if you have any familiarity with them, are very closed. Um, yes, there's HIPAA, yes, there's PHI, those are all important, but there are ways to make data available and to furnish that data to third parties that protects people's identities and still enables an ecosystem to thrive. And that's one of the things that we have done at Collective Health. We've built our infrastructure in such a way that third parties can consume the data that we produce, the claims data that we transact, the patient data that we, that we produce in a way that protects their identities but enables them to create novel services that span the gamut from telemedicine on one end to autism care on the other, to diabetes management to, on the other, to second opinion services, to all sorts of others. And we already, two and a half years into our company's existence, have over five dozen product partners who are building their services utilizing our infrastructure, whether it's eligibility information, whether it's claims information, or whether it's other patient-related information or treatment or utilization information. And we think that is going to be critical to really getting this industry into gear and driving the pace of innovation that we would all want to see, I think, in the health insurance system, which has been lacking, unfortunately, over the last you know, several decades. And from the employer's perspective, kind of going back to the market that we initially serve, we have heard time and again that we just want some modern tools to understand what we're paying for and why. We have these great tools that help us understand our sales pipelines. We have these fantastic tools that understand how people are tracking from other HR metric, from other HR metric standpoint in our organization. We have great tools to help us plan our budgets but we don't have a tool to help us efficiently and effectively manage the second biggest line item oftentimes in our company, which is how much we spend on healthcare. And I don't want to rehash statistics that other, pe that other people have publicly talked about, but you know, General Motors, for example, spends more on healthcare every year than they do on steel. And so it's just a reminder that healthcare is a huge cost for most employers, whether they're small on one end or whether they're Fortune 50 employers on the other. And yet for the most part, there aren't tools out there that reflect, at least nothing that's scalable, that reflects the need to be able to manage that spend optimally. And so what, what do we do exactly? Well, we do everything that a health insurance company does, except for bare risk. Again, our customers are employers that are self-insured. They're ones that use their balance sheet to pay for their own health care costs. But we do everything else that a health insurance company does, and we do it at a level of quality and user experience and transparency and clarity that simply just does not exist in the industry. 
And so that means for members, for individuals, we do everything from help them make plan decisions during open enrollment to providing plan materials to helping guide them to the best course of care at any given time through online and mobile and telephonic user interfaces. And just a level of interest um, in them as, as customers that frankly is lacking in an industry where the average net promoter score is in the single digits. Ours is 75. And a lot of people will tell me, well, I don't think health insurance could ever be something that people love. And I think that that's absolutely not true. The highest net promoter score of any company in the world is an insurance company. It's USAA. They're not a health insurance company, but they are an insurance company. And their net promoter score is 81. It's higher than Apple's, higher than Amazon's, higher than Google's, higher than Nordstrom's, higher than some of the greatest consumer brands that we've all heard of. Um, and they are, as a result, they as, as a result have a cult-like following in terms of their customers. And that is what we aspire to be. We aspire to be the health insurance company that people actually truly love. I, I'm sure if I pulled everyone in this room and asked them, how much do you love picking up the phone and calling your health insurance company, I would get an enthusiastic, yes, I love calling my insurance company. Is that right? Because that's I love calling my insurance company. It's a lot of fun. I do now. I like calling Collective Health, but I did not like calling my previous insurance company. And then similarly for employers, HR and finance teams, we provide a level of technical sophistication, again, that just does not exist in the health insurance industry that enables them to completely streamline their workflows and stop having to pass spreadsheets and physical paper files back and forth between a provider system on one end, a health insurance carrier on another, a third-party telemedicine provider or on-site clinic on another. I mean, everything today, in health insurance at least, seems to be completely mired in paperwork, and most of it is completely unnecessary. Moreover, the data that you get back from the system, the feedback that you get, is so antiquated, so difficult to decipher, that most of these reports that they get back, and report, I think, is a generous way of describing it, most of the paperwork that employers get back from their health insurance company immediately ends up in the recycling bin because it's pretty useless. And people, employers, feel like they're just on a roller coaster or a treadmill where costs just go up every year, and I have no understanding as to why or what can I do about it. And that's really got to change. And here's just an example of what some of our user interfaces look like. Yes, we do produce paper stuff because it's important for people to have cards in case they don't have a phone that can handle things like an electronic card. And we produce plan materials, benefit statements, we have portals. I mean, it's a modern health insurance experience in the same way that logging into American Express or your bank is a modern financial services experience. And we think that this, just from a pure member standpoint, could actually obviate the need for a lot of the call center staff that people have in this industry. And as a result, our call center staffing ratios are significantly better than the industry average. And people, when given tools like this, do tend to self-serve, do tend to discover and make decisions on their own without the need for human assistance. And the net promoter score and the satisfaction that they exhibit because of that empowerment is quite remarkable. As I said earlier, our net promoter score of 75 is an order of magnitude higher than the industry average as a result. And here is just a kind of a closer snapshot of what you would see versus your traditional explanation of benefit that you get from your health insurance carrier. Similarly, and this is my background, I'm a consumer tech guy by background and worked on search for many years at Yahoo and, and other places. Um, it's really astonishing to me how hard it is to actually be able to search for a practitioner and get the information that you need to make an informed decision. Um, it's not a trivial exercise to aggregate all of this information, not just for medical practitioners, but also for vision practitioners, pharmacies, um, surgery centers, you, know, you name it. But we do. We bring it all together in one place. And then we append all sorts of information, including cost and quality information, to help people make an informed decision when they're searching for care. And so as a result, we have about 35,000 members on our platform right now. Uh, here are just some of the employers that we have who have chosen to work with us versus working with a traditional health insurance company, and that list is growing. I unfortunately can't list and enumerate all the customers that we have. The list is long, and we're also under non-disclosure agreements with some of them, so I can't talk about them all, but you know, the list is growing, and it's a large number already. And just some of the reasons why the customers that we have are choosing us. Um, 
process is a big one. People feel like they spend all day in process within these organizations, making decisions around whether or not a plan should have this size of a deductible or that size of a copay or this size of a coinsurance or that size of an out-of-pocket maximum. And we automate all of those decisions using software. And the benefit plan design process with Collective Health is a really, really rapid, really self-evident one. We run claims and then we produce sort of programmatically suggested plan designs that make the most sense for that population versus trying to jerry-rig the population in an off-the-shelf plan that fits the sort of antiquated and stale claim system that we have running in the back room, which is not the case. Similarly, we have a large transportation technology company who will remain unnamed that is data obsessed and wants to understand whether or not their drivers are healthier than their office staff and what they can do to keep those people as healthy as possible. And the kinds of cohort controlled analyses that we can run on that data for that company is a level of sophistication that they just simply cannot get from an existing health insurer. And those are just a couple of examples of why people have chosen to work with us. And similarly, back to my point about being able to actually love your health insurance company, we poll our customers regularly, our members regularly, and in addition to the high net promoter score that I, that I mentioned earlier, we pull them to get verbatims to hear exactly how they feel about us as a company. And, you know, I tell people we run a call center, yes, but our call center is in our headquarters. Um, it is literally in the middle of our headquarters. It is the, the crown jewel of our company. And I tell people the reason why that's the case is because we don't view it like a call center. That is our primary user interface. When you think about the thing that differentiates an Amazon or a Nordstrom or any great consumer brand from another, Apple being a great example, it's that they don't view the act of engaging their customers as a chore or as an expense. They view it as an opportunity. They view it as an opportunity to learn what their customers think about them. They view it as an opportunity to discover new ways that they can help and support their customers. They view it as an opportunity to learn how they can be more efficient as an organization. And that is why our engineers, our product managers, our designers, our operations staff all sit with our member advocates and observe and model and figure out where can we do things better? How can we get to an answer more quickly? How can we satisfy our customers? And if that call center was in some remote location halfway across the country or halfway around the world, that opportunity for learning would be completely lost. And as a result, the tooling and the software that we've developed has enabled us to run that, that call center much more efficiently and actually more than make up for the cost differential of putting it in some cheaper place halfway around the country or halfway around the world and then yield a user experience that is 10 times better than the industry average. This is just a screenshot of what we do for employers because again, as the payers, as the people ultimately you know, paying and footing the bill for care, they need to know where things stand and what they need to pay for and why. So we handle everything from their plan design to their eligibility to optimizing their programs, accounting, analytics reporting, member outreach, and a lot more. And we do it using modern tools like this web app um, that's up here on the screen. And it's stuff that looks like unlike anything that they've ever seen from a health insurance carrier. And that's just the surface. I think what is often lost on people when you think about you know, re-engineering a, a industry like this is just how much work has to go under the waterline before you can actually even peek yourself up above the waterline. Take Tesla, for example. They had the Roadster for nearly 10 years um, before launching the Model S, which is their real sort of production vehicle. And they were just testing battery technology and drivetrain technology and making sure that all of those innards worked correctly and spent hundreds of millions of dollars doing that before they could produce a production-worthy automobile. Similarly, not quite as, I think, involved from a hardware standpoint, but from a software standpoint, we have a lot of stuff that we need to re-engineer under the waterline, everything from how we handles, handle people's data to how we integrate with other systems, whether it's provider, patient medical record systems on one end, bank accounts, FSA, HSA, HRA systems on the other, HRIS systems, HR systems, um, third-party program, software systems. There's a lot of stuff that goes into actually making health insurance work well or the way that we expect it to work. And the UI, although we obsess about the UI as well, is really just a fraction of all of that. 
And then lastly, um, it does come down to the people. I'm a product of this university. It's a great university, as is my co-founder, Roger, who's also an MD, PhD. And we have a team of about 250 people now who come from some of the best organizations, best universities in the world. We're very fortunate to have some of the best financial backers in the world as well to help us prosecute this vision. It's gonna take a very long time to reinvent health insurance. We understand that. But we think we have as good a shot as anyone at doing it. And I have eight minutes left, and so I'd like to welcome questions and ask anyone if they'd like to know more. No? Okay. Thanks for your time. <laughs>